Hey, I'm Tyler Jones, and you're listening to the Element Podcast. What's going on, my woods people? We are sitting here in Sulphur Springs, Texas again, and we are on the comfy, cozy, brand new couch from Nebraska Furniture Mart. <laughs> and you can hear KC chuckling in the background. What's going on, dude? Man, not a lot. I'm trying to situate. This couch is so comfy, it kind of swallows you a little bit. But <laughs> I know, it's, I sleep on it every yeah. night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, kind of oh. rubbing my belly. We just had a good, good oh, lunch. And... I ate too much gumbo. I was falling back in my chair, just sitting there like, I'm going to be worthless the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I ate a bunch of elk stir fry today, too. Shared that with you a little bit. It mm-hmm. was super spicy and super tasty. It was. Yep, yeah, it was. I liked it a lot. It was. You had me worried because you like spicy foods, and you're a little bit crazy. So, like, <laughs> you put those together, and when you say, this stuff is pretty hot, I'm thinking, blow your head off style, you know. And it wasn't that bad. It was, no. It was actually... Like perfect, what I consider perfect. You mm-hmm. had the perfect dish. Dude. It's what you call the good burn. Yeah, it was. It was man. a good burn. It, you know, the, had Serrano's. your lips going a little bit. Yeah, serrano peppers, man. Gosh, I love serranos. Like I, I mean, I'm a true Texan. Jalapenos are where my heart lies, but serrano peppers just add like it's just a sharper heat, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It, it, and uh, it they mix really good with other veggies cooked. I yeah. think personally, and serranos are funny because like you cut them and eat them raw, like in pico or something like that. And pico de gallo, in case you don't know what pico is. <laughs> We're not talking about rooster combs. But, uh, <laughs> like, you eat them in pico de gallo, and they're really not that spicy. They're just got a decent little flavor. But, man, you put a little cooking on them, my oh, goodness. <laughs> it makes a big difference for sure. Yeah. It was too hot for my wife last night, so I felt kind of bad. I always try to not cook things that she will eat, of course, you mm-hmm. know, as opposed to making them too spicy. And it's too spicy last night, so... I got to make up for that tonight and cook something that's more bland. We're going to have kebabs tonight, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Kebabs. Yeah. Good old kebabs, man. Kebabs are good. I like yeah, them. Yeah, they are. They? Mm-hmm. So you had gumbo for lunch. What was in the gumbo? Um, I had uh, widgeons and whitetails in there. Widgeons man. and whitetails, dude. Yeah. We had, uh, uh, I got a buddy that um, uh, I kind of, he's a, uh, I guess a co chairman here in Sulphur Springs for the Ducks Unlimited chapter and uh and i'm involved in the uh i guess you could call me a chairman of the emory chapter which is much less of a big deal <laughs> and uh <laughs> anyway we're we're good for, we become good friends in the last year or so and uh anyway he he took me uh well first of all he brought me a couple weekends ago a bunch of widgeons one morning he was like he texted me he said hey uh you want some ducks because i had texted him and said that i wanted some ducks if he had any extras and he was like you want some ducks i got some this morning and I was like, sure. He said, I'll be there in two minutes. Well, it was like 7.30. And I was like, um, I'm in my boxers on set at 7.30 on a Saturday. So I went in my room and threw some shorts on real quick. And he was at my door before I could get back in here. But uh, anyway, gave me some, uh, gave me a lemon of widgeons. And I cleaned them up and took on my dad, and who has learned a, a gumbo recipe from a Cajun woman that rocks. I mean, it is... It's the best food I've ever had, pretty much. There's two things that I like, pretty much head and shoulders above anything else. And then I, other than that, I can't really tell you what those two, like which one actually beats the other one. But uh, there's a shrimp and grits that is sold at uh, the Ben 303 in Rockwall. Oh, my goodness. It rocks my world. And then the gumbo is right there with it. So you got to have your two most favorite foods in, in one conjunction week. with one, one another. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Special guy. Because I had a I had a birthday this past week. How'd you turn? 32? <laughs> <laughs> 22. The running joke with Tyler is I make him a year older about every day we talk. So <laughs> uh that gumbo's good, man. I, I for sure would vouch for that being one of the top three that I've eaten. You yeah. know, it's it's a lot more uh, uh less soupy, I guess yeah, you would say. Thick. Than yeah. most gumbo gumbos I've eaten. It almost reminds me of like a oh, I don't know, like a Chicken and dumplings mm-hmm. texture more, you know, not not taste nothing like that, you know, but yeah. it's what it's like eating. That's good. He good said, stuff. He said he did something. He had used something different. One of the fats that he used was different than what he usually uses or something. Yeah. So he said he didn't think it tasted quite as good as the rest that he's made. Oh, but man. it's it's really good. So yeah. anyway, had uh, had the, that happen, and then 
um, kind of, I guess, weaseled my way into a duck hunt uh, later the next weekend, which was this past weekend. And uh, that was my first duck hunt of the year, I'm sad to say. My goodness. The last weekend of the year. So Yeah. How'd y'all do? Um, <clears throat> we did good, man. We were on a, a pretty big little uh, tank and, um, you know, birds come in early on a tank and land out in the middle. And so, and the wind was kind of weird, apparently, for what they normally deal with there. Uh, kind of had, a, I guess, a west wind. And so we kind of, we were in, we had four people and we set up kind of what we thought was the wrong spot at first. And this huge group started coming in for about five minutes, just, you know, several large, large groups of birds were coming in. And, uh, and so two of us split over, two of us stayed where we were at and the other two went to the other side of the pond and we kind of kind of got into them pretty good uh we could have killed more if we'd have been set up in a different spot i think but uh i think we had like 15 birds between the four mm-hmm. of us it was fun i was it was a, definitely a good duck hunt it wasn't slow and we didn't stay around till 10 a.m you know mm-hmm. I, I just i'm not a big guy i'm not a big fan of like once the action slows down i'm not a big fan of just staying out there because you're trying to get your limit mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like if, if it's if it's not happening anymore, like I'm not going to stay there for two more groups to come in late or whatever. Yeah. Usually, you know. So, were y'all fun. picky, or did y'all like just shoot tasty ducks, or did y'all shoot most of them? I, I mean, I it was mostly gadwalls. We we got into uh, we had a couple of widgeon groups of widgeons come in, and we just couldn't get them really within range. Uh, and we shot one green wing teal. Uh, so it was mostly you know gadwalls and a teal, and then we had one ring net come in. And I would, I didn't even pull my gun up. <laughs> I, I am picky about the ducks. I mean, I, they're, you know, I want to shoot what I'm going to eat, and I'm not going to clean a ring net because it's almost impossible to break through the skin, even with a knife. So, <laughs> um, anyway, ended up that night. I got home and I cleaned those birds up, or I cleaned up the limits worth, and uh, marinated them for several hours. And made poppers out of them. Oh, I know man. You made fun of it. Poppers. I know you made fun of it. <laughs> hey, you know, at the end of the day, there's nothing easier to make, really, than poppers, you know? So, like, if you want to enjoy a good wild game dinner and you want it to be delicious and true to Texas, you'd make duck poppers, <laughs> you know? Like, I mean, they're good. Yeah. You oh, know? It was, they were incredible. Mm-hmm. Like, I really am trying to cook more often with this wild game and expand what I do. Um, and... <clears throat> I put a marinade on them and just I had sliced uh, each breast into a half basically, mm-hmm. which was just right, man. I mean, and uh, so when I got back from Walmart later that day, I uh, took sliced uh, jalapenos into like four or six, you know, quartered them up or maybe not quite that big, and then uh, took cream cheese, put it inside the jalapeno slice, put the cream cheese in between the jalapeno and the duck, wrapped it with bacon, you know, and and uh, and then put them on the grill and basically just cooked them on one side as hot as I, you know, put the grill as hot as it could get, which my grill barely probably won't even get to 400 and uh, grilled them until basically they kind of came unstuck, flipped them over a couple more minutes and uh, just did the the finger test for. uh, Oh, does the rarity test work on ducks too? It did for me, man. I mean, I felt them and I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, and I go medium or would you go with them? Medium rare. Medium rare. And, uh, you know, there were there were definitely some parts of them could have been called medium easy, you know. Mm-hmm. But like in the middle, there most of them were medium rare. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, dude! It was it was some of the best duck I've ever had, and didn't have to use barbecue sauce or nothing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I think people get really caught up on the whole it's poultry, so it's deadly unless you char it. You know what I mean? And I mean, we've probably talked about this before, but when you shoot something that morning come home, clean it, and marinate it, it has no time for anything nasty to get on it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? As long as you're good with your contamination at home, you know, you could cut those breast cells, ducks, and eat them raw yeah. and be fine. You know, yeah. unless there's like rice breast or something real nasty in there, right. but, and which I don't think that'll kill you either. I mean, they weren't like, they wasn't like the elk meat raw, yeah. you know, but it was it was definitely like when we put them uh, into, the, into the little plate and set them on the counter to get everything ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was blood coming out, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever you want to call that. I guess it's blood. I mean, yeah. it's red blood Juices. juice, you know. And like, I was like, you know, hopefully they're not too underdone. And I cut into them, and they were just perfect, dude. Yeah, and that's good. 
It was good. Really, really, really good. I, I was uh, kind of sad that like I didn't get to go duck hunt more often and do that. You know? What else did you do Saturday? Well, um, I had to had to go trooping without you for a little oh, bit. Oh, my gosh. I know, dude. Uh, but uh, I went uh, and checked out some new stuff on uh, uh, new public land stuff and um, and found some interesting things, man. Um we talked a little bit about it, but good, interesting, or bad, interesting. We've referred to bad, interesting on public. We have, so yeah. maybe this is maybe I should use a different word for that. <laughs> I found some awesome things. Some awesome things, cool. Um, so you know, like um, found some some areas that I think are not too far from the road um, that you know still are kind of like not in the like they're not in the crosshairs when you look at that property on a map. Mm-hmm. And you go, that's where I want to go, mm-hmm. you know. And I just happened to kind of end up there. I was with Jet, and uh, you're basically, son. yeah. And I basically had to carry him on my shoulders. <laughs> so you know, we we didn't go super far, but we were over a half mile, uh, as I measured it out. It it seemed to be over, you know, several a couple hundred yards over a half mile or so. So it was it was back in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking at this this area, um, you know, there's uh, this particular public property. There's not just a ton of agriculture around it, um, but there, you know, happened to be this happened to be close to an ag field. Well, we didn't really know. Mm-hmm. You kind of sent me in there to look, and uh, actually, one of the fields was just coastal Bermuda, which is. Prominent around here, worthless. And it's worth when it comes to wildlife for, for deer. I mean, you'll see them out in it sometimes, but they're usually, as far as I understand, they're eating something else that's in it. You yeah, know? It's in and, it for sure. And it's not it's not a crop, you know, for for deer at all. So, um, anyway, the the there was another field um, in that area that was agged up, and uh, ended up finding a good trail leading into it from from uh, the public and. <clears throat> found some mud on the fence deer trail yeah yeah because there's mud on the fence on the top string so you mm-hmm. know the deer have been jumping over and, and what he's saying here is that it's hard to tell sometimes with the hogs you know what's really been using it but yeah there were several deer tracks <clears throat> rubs uh <clears throat> right in there on the on the inside of the, the tree line there um and i just felt really really good about it man mm-hmm. and it's kind of in one of those spots just kind of out of the way uh far enough that I don't think there's going to be a ton of action right in there. I didn't mm-hmm. see, you know, any action from people, any stands or anything. Uh, just, you know, kind of what we're, we're keen in on is trying to find places that people are not normally mm-hmm. hunting. And it may not be where the biggest deer in the woods is necessarily, but there's, you know, that we've seen that there can definitely be some good solid deer there. Oh, yeah, you know? for sure. And the biggest deer... And the woods might go through there. You right. Know, that's the thing. And, like, I can remember, you know, through my years growing up and learning to hunt, looking for the big trees and thinking that's where the deer are. Mm-hmm. And that's not really true at all. And I think that a lot of people do that. And I still am guilty of it at sometimes because when I walk up to a spot, I'm looking for the biggest tree to put my stand in. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> which might not always be the best location, right. you know. And I think that that's something that, I mean, we're going to start really – I'm not going to say key in on, but explore. observe and explore yeah. and, you know, kind of experiment with in the 2017 season and see how that goes for us. Mm-hmm, definitely. You know, not to say we aren't going to hunt some big woods too, but, you know, it's something we've noticed for sure that, you know, hey, when a deer lays down, he needs three feet of cover. Right. You know, three feet. Yeah. You know, vertically. I mean, and even when they're laying down sometimes, they don't they don't necessarily need cover if mm-hmm. they are set up right. Uh, that they feel safe, you yeah, know. For sure. I mean, they can sit there in the wide open, watching cars from a half mile away, and you could be looking right at them in in the car and not see them because they blend in with everything, mm-hmm. and they feel safe because they can see anything coming from a half mile and smell anything behind them. So, yeah, you know, it's it's a uh, it's not necessarily that they need any particular thing. So you have to really get creative with your thoughts and and how and where you're going to go scouting sometimes to get away from people and look look in the places that not everybody's going. Mm-hmm. And it turns up a lot of empty searches sometimes. Yeah, but it does. you got to be uh, not afraid to wear out a couple pairs of boots yeah. to find a good spot because yep. we've had 
quite a few occasions already this year that treks and ex- explorations turned out negative, mm-hmm. which is still a positive. So, yeah, yeah it's part so, of it. So we got an interview coming up here. Yeah, with uh, Whit Fosberg of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Mm. That's coming up here in just a minute. Um, before we get to that, here in a couple of weeks, we're going to be going out of state, right? Oh man, we're going out of state, dude. Yeah. So you are most likely going to draw. Well, <laughs> there's a good chance. Good yeah, chance. There's a good chance. A good chance you're going to draw the coveted Iowa tag. So. Right now, me and you were both talking earlier, we need a trip. Like, my wanderlust soul is just getting worn down. Even though I love where I live, I just want to go somewhere and get away for yep. a little bit, you know. And I'm not the kind of guy who wants to go and sit on the beach and drink, you know, fruity drinks all day. You right. know, like, that's not my thing. I do like the beach, but I want a fish pole in my hand when I'm there, you <laughs> yeah, know. Me too. So, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so we're going to get out and get a little bit of wild places, hopefully, and uh, we're gonna do some public land scouting in public Iowa. Land scouting, yeah. And uh, so, what happened on Saturday? Me and Tyler were supposed to go and explore that place together, but my wife and I had to make a unexpected emergency room trip a little bit earlier in the week for her sickness. She's fine now, but uh, Saturday I just didn't feel comfortable leaving her at home by herself. I just wanted to make sure I was there to take care of her. And, you know. Fulfill my husbandly duties, mm-hmm. <laughs> giving her medicine and stuff. So I stayed at home and hot spotted off my phone all day and looked at maps of Iowa and got a bunch of GPS coordinates of what I think will be good bedding areas, good funnels, maybe secondary funnels that you don't see. I noticed that uh, on some maps you can select different layers and not the topographical, but the hydrology maps are super helpful because it's almost like. They took an electron microscope and just ran it across the whole surface, and you see exactly mm-hmm. the way things work. And it's like shaded relief, so you can see where there's draws and valleys and stuff like that. Super cool. So that's what I did on Saturday. wasn't near yeah. as cool as yours, but well, it was helpful. it's going to help us out big time because he – I don't have internet at my house, <laughs> which is embarrassing to say, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I I definitely don't get to spend as much time doing that stuff. So it's good that you have uh, a good idea going into this. Uh, and I, you know, following you around on public land this year, I definitely trust that, trust your eye and uh, your mind to see what's going to hopefully, you know, transpire into good mm-hmm. whitetail habitat. Yeah, so. for sure. You know, I've hunted a lot of public land all through my life. Uh, part of that just being because we aren't wealthy people and don't have the money for a lease, and part of it too because I enjoy the challenge. And it's cool how there's certain principles of public land that apply no matter if you're in Texas hunting whitetails here in Iowa hunting you know, big giants up there or in Colorado on national forest land hunting elk there. And that's the place that's, you know, really near and dear to my heart and something we're going to talk to Witt about because as of right now, our public lands are in great danger. And something here in Texas we don't feel as much because we don't have a ton of public land and what we do have is mostly state land. Right. But And the attack is coming on federal land. Yeah, attack's coming on federal land because that's what the feds – have access to. They want to give it to the state. Yeah. Well, they want to sell it off. Right. They which, want to under give it the to cover, the state, which would... Yeah. Under the cover of selling off. We'll talk right. to Witt about that. Yeah. But just know that, you know, if you've ever dreamed about going and chasing bugle and elk in September, you know, or you want to go way up to a high mountain stream and catch, you know, native Snake River cutties or something like that, uh, those places are in grave danger right now. And part of it's uh, us and who we voted into office to blame. So we kind of need to do something about it. Yeah, and if you're if you're listening, and uh, you have a bunch of oil money, <laughs> you might be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, you definitely, you know, uh, probably if you're uh, if you're connected well, you might have an opportunity to buy, <laughs> buy that place of land, <laughs> that land, and have a pronghorn antelope to yourself or whatever. <laughs> but uh, if you're not, you know, then uh, you know definitely need to stand up and fight for what for what you believe in. And the funny thing is, even even that person with a lot of oil money, mm-hmm. they own that land already. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So yeah. it's not it's not like. It's just they can't kick everybody off. It's time for us to <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's time yeah. for us to fight for what we own. How how weird is that to say? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, it doesn't feel right, but it is. No, it's yeah. truth. We, we, own the land. we own this, and people in Congress are talking about taking it from us, 
and giving it to the states, giving it back to the states. I've heard that from one of our near and dear senators here in Texas. Which they never had. Which they never had. Yeah. The states never had the land. Yep. It's true. So, so uh, I guess the best thing to do now would be able to get somebody who has a lot more knowledge about this subject than, you know, yeah, than we do. Have them right. talk about this. So mm-hmm. you want to get get Wit on the phone real quick? Yeah, let's give Wit a call. Let's do it. On the line right now, we have Wit Fosberg. What's going on, Wit? Not much, Tyler. How are you? We're doing good, man. We're uh, in sunny Texas today and uh, uh, just kind of doing some remodeling on a house on my house right now. So uh, it's uh, it's nice and quiet right now, though. <laughs> well, it is uh, not too quiet here in Washington D.C. A little chaotic these days. I I can't imagine for sure. Well, uh, I guess uh, as an intro, man, why don't you go ahead and just, for the listener, let us know who you are and how you got where you are today. Uh, well, I'm, uh, my name is Whit Fosberg, and I'm the president and CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And, you know, I've been doing this stuff all sort of federal conservation policy, really since I got out of college here in D.C., and I've worked for you know, the U.S. Senate, um, you know, Senator Tom Daschle, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, ran their fisheries program, uh, Was with, did a long stint with Trout Unlimited, um, and then about six years ago came over as the president and CEO here. Uh, your listeners may not know a whole lot about us. We're a coalition of about 50 different outdoor groups, um, ranging from you know, Ducks Unlimited and you know, Mule Deer Foundation to you know, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust and American Sport Fishing Association. But we also have you know, some untraditional members like the Outdoor Industry Association, which is the trade association for you know, REI and Eastern Mountain Sports and companies like that. Uh, important partners of ours because they talk about jobs and conservation. We also have AFL-CIO as a partner because 70% of their 12 million members hunt and fish. Um, Nature Conservancy and the Land Trust movement are a part of it because Conserving land is important if you want to hunt and fish. Absolutely. Well, that's uh, that's great information there. We, uh, you probably have answered several of our questions <laughs> just in that little opening statement there. Um, that's good to know. Uh, so you, you guys kind of, um, if you'll run me through again one more time. So you guys are you encompass uh, several conservation organizations. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, we're 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 not really a trade association. Nobody pays dues to be part of it. But if you think about the genesis of conservation in America, it was really the hunters and the anglers and sportsmen that you know created the modern conservation system, going all the way back to Theodore Roosevelt. And he did it because you know he really credited getting outside and hunting and you know spending his time in the wild with making him the man that he was. And that was in Maine and North Dakota and the Adirondacks, you know those places. And he really thought it was it should be part of what the American experience is to have everybody have that ability to get out and you know prove themselves and experience you know become you know a man in you know nature. And so he during his presidency set aside about 240 million acres you know, for everybody to go out and hunt and fish and you know, use in perpetuity. And then, you know, look further on, you know, we created a series of environmental laws, conservation laws. We stopped the market hunting. Um, you know, we even created tax to ourselves during the Depression so that we could fund the modern conservation system. So today, every time you buy your guns, ammo, you know, fishing tackle, motorboat fuel, you're paying an excise tax of 10 or 11% that pays for conservation in America. It money that goes back to the states. And so when you see a guy out, you know, in Texas, you know, sort of your, your game warden, you know, that guy is being paid for by sportsman's dollars. 80% of the state agencies out there get, you know, basically your, you know, their budgets come from sportsman's dollars, be it excise taxes or license sales or tags. And then these groups they were cra- popped up beginning in the 1930s with Ducks Unlimited, and then in the 1950s with Trout Unlimited, and then you know, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you know, the Rough Grouse Society, Pheasants Forever, Turkey Federation. I mean, these groups have done an amazing job of bringing back species that were once, you know, almost at the edge. You think about, you know, back in the turn of the century when Roosevelt was around, it was rare for anybody to see a white-tailed deer. The black bear were basically gone. Wild turkeys were gone. You know, elk were at, you know, a tenth of you know, the population as they are today. You know, so we had a real crisis, and, you know, a lot of these groups can really just pat themselves on the back for the work they did in bringing those species back from the brink. Now, there was a downside of that, too, in that today every species group, every species out there has a group fighting for it. 
you know, be it, you know, sheep or mule deer or elk or trout or bass or snook or tarpon, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, there's a group out there protecting it. But during that proliferation of the species groups, it sort of took the collective eye off the ball in terms of federal policy. And we started to see, you know, that nobody was paying attention to the really big issues that affected everybody, public lands policy, agriculture policy, funding of the agencies. And so in 2002, a guy named Jim Range, who had been, you know, Howard Baker's chief of staff, and Baker was the majority leader of the U.S. Senate under Reagan, you know, lifelong Republican from Tennessee, and Jim was his chief of staff. And Jim had written a bunch of the sort of seminal environmental laws during the 1970s that, you know, Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, things like that. Um, but it drove him crazy how ineffective he thought the hunting and fishing community was. He'd get lobbied by, you know, a half dozen different groups and their little niche issues. They'd never talk to each other. They'd never work together. And he really feared that, you know, the community, hunting and fishing, conservation, was winning little battles and losing big wars. At the same time, you had the rise of the environmental community, which, you know, basically turned off a lot of the sportsmen. These guys were sort of perceived as hippies, very litigious, you know, sort of, you know, not the, you know, the typical culture of, you know, the, you know, hunter and angler. And so, you know, I think that we, we as a community, the sporting community, really lost our voice in Washington. And the TRCP was created to try to bring that voice back. And I think we've done a pretty good job with that. I mean, listen, I mean, Pheasants Forever doesn't really care about what happens to marine fisheries policy, um, but Bonefish and Tarpon Trust and, you know, American Sport Fishing Association and Coastal Conservation Association, those guys care a lot. And so what we try to do is become that umbrella where we bring folks together to speak in a common voice on those issues that we all care about and, you know, can all put our shoulder to the wheel to move collectively. Awesome. Um you know, for us here in Texas, it's, uh, it's, this is a lot of this stuff is new, at least to us. Um, here's, you know, in, in the two of us on this podcast and I'm sure to many people. Um, so it's good to hear stuff like this and some of the concerns that, um, uh, personally I have, um, have, uh, derived in my mind, uh, include, well, what is the, you know, who is there out there for the greater voice of recreationalists on public land? And I think that, uh, that's one reason I wanted to do this interview today because I, I see that you guys uh, kind of become the voice for everybody, and all of a sudden now we're not just these little, little you know, fires all over the country trying to fight a big war. Like you said, it's uh, it's um, you know, a bigger voice. So that's uh, it's great. Yeah, you know, I think public public lands is a good example of sort of how we work. I mean, you know, public lands is sort of fundamental. I mean, in Texas, you guys don't have much in the way of public lands. I mean, most of the <laughs> hunting that happens down there is happening on private lands, and that's great if you happen to have that private land or can afford a lease or, you know, something like that. But, you know, around the nation, we have about 640 million acres of public lands, and it is sort of what separates, makes us different than, say, a lot of the European countries. Here, you know, we have something called the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation, and one of those tenets is sort of the democracy of hunting and fishing. Everybody can do it, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of whether you're a landowner. And the place that a lot of folks do that is on the public lands. In the western United States, about 72% of all hunting happens on public lands. Nationally, about half the hunters hunt some or all of the time on public lands. So if those public lands were to go away, you know, it would essentially end hunting as we know it today in America. I mean, yeah, you still have it in Texas if you can afford to do it, and uh, you'd have it in other places. But, you know, for the average Joe out there who doesn't have a lease, who doesn't have his own, you know, ranch, um, you know, it takes away a real opportunity. So uh, since we're kind of on the subject, can you explain to those who may not know uh, what, what's in Bill 621 and what stands to be lost? Well, the 621 is just one example of what we've been seeing really over the last three years or so, which is this sort of concerted effort that really has been around since Theodore Roosevelt's time of these private interests that want to get their hands on the public lands. And we've had everything from proposals to sell off all the public lands to basically you know, balance the budget. Um, and then we've had more subtle things like just transfer them to the states and let the states manage them. And or in the case of H.R. 621, that one would solve about 3 million acres, you know, to, quote, help balance the budget. 
Now, listen, there's some federal lands out there that are excess, and I think we all agree with that. And there's a process in place in federal government where you can you know, get rid of those little you know, acre here or there that don't really make any sense for the federal government to hold and would honestly be better in hand someplace else. But the act under which most of that happens, you know, the revenues for those little sales would go back into a fund to pay for other conservation. And what HR 621 would do is just sell straight out 3 million acres and not have anything come back to the sportsmen or the recreationalists to use as public lands. And what we see is that is the beginning of the a slope of you start nickel and diming the system and selling off little bits. All right, sure, it's some excess lands right now to balance the budget. Tomorrow it may be an entire national forest or an entire national wildlife refuge. When the you know, Congress was debating the Puerto Rican debt bill, they tried to slip in a provision to sell off the Vieques National Wildlife Refuge in Puerto Rico to, quote, help, you know, to you know, get rid of that to help you know, Puerto Rico's debt. Well, listen, that refuge doesn't just belong to Puerto Rico. It belongs to all of us. And it's just one more attempt that we're seeing of you know, folks who fundamentally don't believe in the public land system to try to you know, chink it away. Now, during the election, um, you know, actually Donald Trump, to his credit, ran on a platform of keeping the public lands in public hands. And, you know, we've, we've talked a lot with, you know, you know at that, that time candidate Trump, now President Trump, about the importance of this, and he was great on this issue during the campaign. His son, Don Jr., is an avid hunter, sportsman. Um, you know, both he and then, you know, his brother Eric actually go down to Texas a good bit and hunt and uh, get it, and so you know, they've been very strong on you know, sort of pushing back on this. But you know, that has not stopped you know, these forces that don't like public lands to keep you know, trying these different things. There was another bill in Congress that got introduced last year that actually passed out of the House Resources Committee that would essentially allow every state in the nation to buy 2 million acres of national forest and take it out of multiple use, which is what it is today, and put it into the, basically, you have to manage it for timber production, period. And then there was nothing in the provision that after a state were to do that and go in and clear cut it, they couldn't just sell it off to developers and have it developed. It would exit the public estate altogether. So these are the kind of things we're dealing with, and we need sportsmen to stand up and push back because fundamentally it's an attack on hunting and fishing in America. Okay. Uh, KC, you want to weigh in on, you got any questions or anything for Whit? Yeah. Hey, Whit, KC here. Um, it's good talking to you, and it's good to hear your insight. Um, you touched on something earlier, and I wanted to talk about. Uh, this year was probably the hardest ballot I've ever casted as an adult. You know, I'm not very old, but um, voted in a few cycles here. And for me, you know, I grew up uh, mostly leaning towards the right side of the political scale. Um, it was really tough, but when, you know, now President Trump came out to stand on the public lands platform, you know, kind of in the face of most of the Republican Party, it kind of gave me some insurance to think that, you know, my vote will be safe. Um, however, it's not all about the president, as we all know, you know, so it's kind of tough to uh, place your votes and be a constituent of, you know, different senators and stuff um, who have separate allegiances than myself on certain topics, while some other topics of, you know, morality or uh, Second Amendment rights and things like that, I do agree with. So where do we fall in that place? Uh, is it a thing where... And we're just going to have to accept that we're going to vote for a senator who's good on guns but bad on public lands or vote the other direction? Yeah, listen, I think – yeah, so, you know, Casey, I think that's a great question. I think a lot of sportsmen have grappled with it. For too long, we've sort of allowed politicians to get away with, you know, if I'm good on Second Amendment, I can call myself the friend of the sportsman, and I can be really crappy on everything involving public lands, clean water, you know, you name it. And listen, that's not fair. Listen, I own a lot of guns. I support the Second Amendment strongly, but that's not enough. I mean, if you care about the sportsman, you know, you also have to care about, you know, public lands, access, clean water, things like that. I mean, look at the, you've seen them off in Texas, but look at what we had to, to deal with in Florida this past year, where you had algal blooms off of both coasts that shut down fishing all over Florida. And, you know, that is because you got, you know, really lousy water coming out of, 
you know, Lake Okeechobee and, you know, some of the rivers in central Florida. Now, that is, you know, a lot of, you know, politicians don't think of that as a sportsman's issue, but that is as much of a sportsman's issue as, you know, Second Amendment, in my mind. And I hope that, you know, in other people's minds, too. So if you want to be call yourself a friend of the sportsman, you got to be do more than just be good on Second Amendment. That's my opinion. How are hunters and anglers and then other recreationalists um, reacting to the push, you know, to dispose of public lands? And, and um, you know, are there any of these groups reacting differently um, than kind of the majority of these outdoor recreationalists, or are they kind of being pretty cohesive with the way they, they're pursuing things here? Well, I mean, I, I think you see a mix. I think that, uh, you know, people are starting to wake up and realize that, you know, this isn't just some lunatic fringe that sort of bubbles up every now and then, like the Sagebrush Rebellion or the Shovel Brigade back in Nevada in the 1990s. I mean, this is a well-funded, well-organized campaign to get rid of public lands. And it's very sophisticated, and it's happening at the local level, it's happening at the state level, and it's happening at the national level. And it's going to continue happening if we don't rise up and push back on it. Now, I think you've seen, you know, we have something called www.sportsmansaccess.org, which is a website we helped create with some of our partners to allow sportsmen to go in and sign a petition and say, basically, Congress, keep your hands off my public lands. And we have about 40,000 signatures on that so far. You have some of the, you know, the, you know, the other conservation groups. I mean, listen, a lot of the hunting and fishing community doesn't want to get involved with advocacy. They don't want to be get political. You know, they want to talk about, you know, what scents to use and how high to put up their deer stand and you know things like that, which are things I love talking about too. <laughs> but you know, at some point, if you call yourself a conservation group and you're trying to protect the legacy that we've had for 100 plus years, you're going to have to get engaged in this. And I think you've seen groups like, you know, National Wildlife Federation, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, you know, Trout Unlimited and some others, you know, be pretty aggressive on this and you know, really start to rise to the challenge. Other groups are still, you know, kind of, you know, hoping it just goes away and they don't have to say anything about it. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has been great on this issue. They've really been pushing hard. Um, we're starting to see a change now also with sort of the hunting celebrities coming out and really getting into this issue. Steve Rinella. Um, you know, Meat Eater, you know, he has been relentless on this issue, really pushing. If you've ever watched his show, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, about, you know, you know, an 18-point, you know, whitetail. It's about, you know, sort of the experience of going into the backcountry, you know, killing an animal, maybe sometimes, sometimes not, you know, and then, you know, eating that animal and really respecting the traditions of hunting and that animal. And he has been great on this issue. Randy Newberg, who does, you know, Fresh Tracks or On Your Own Adventures, he has been great on this issue. But too often, and I, honestly, I think all the hunting and fishing celebrities that use public lands have a responsibility to stand up and be heard on this issue. But you turn on most of those, sun, you know, weekend hunting shows and, you know, folks are just high-fiving it sitting in their, you know, deer stand and, you know, shooting a buck over a feeder. And, you know, that's not good enough. So, you know, I get frustrated with the community. I get frustrated with our, you know, brethren out there. And, yeah, I'd rather be talking about fun stuff than this stuff. But, listen, we have a responsibility to our kids to make sure that what we have today is there for them. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, very much agree with that. Uh, you know, I've been pretty proud of how so-called some of the celebrities, quote, in quotes, um, have reacted to this, you know, it's really cool to see Ranella and Randy and, you know, Joe Rogan, guys like that really be uh, good voices and using their platform to really reach a lot of people. And it's been pretty encouraging. Um, I want to ask you a question about the Pittman-Robertson Act, which you touched on earlier. Um, yep. You know, formulated in 37, I believe, and then uh, amended a few times along the way and then they added another one that's similar for fisheries. Is it time to revisit the Pittman Robertson act and revise or amend to maybe encompass more of our general recreators, you know, our sportsmen, um, I'm more than happy to foot more of the bill, but at sometimes, you know, if it's okay for you to go out and take a picture of a marmot and not really add anything monetarily to conservation, are, are you really helping much? Yeah, it's an issue that's been debated around here for, you know, literally the last 50 years. And I think it's being debated a lot more today because what you're really seeing is, you know, the, our, you know, especially the state fishing game agencies, but also our federal agencies, 
are you know having a real hard time making ends meet. Um, everything is more expensive. They have more issues to deal with from you know endangered species to invasive species to you name it. Um, yeah, they've you know in the note and you know pretty much revenues are flat. And in Congress, you know, conservation funding used to be about two and a half percent of the federal budget back in the 1970s. Today, it's about one percent. So you've seen this gradual starving of you know Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Park Service. And that has been in part because, you know, we've had explosions of costs in other areas, but it's also in part because it's a deliberate effort to, you know, and what they used to say during the Reagan years is to starve the beast. If you cut off the funds for government, you shrink government. Now, it hasn't worked very well for things like Medicare or Social Security or defense, but it's worked pretty darn well for the federal land managing agencies. So we've had this, you know, sort of slow deterioration of their ability to address these challenges, and that's largely money-based. So here's where, you know, the sportsmen come in. You know, we're still buying our licenses. We're buying our tags. We're buying, you know, we're buying our equipment when paying that excise tax. So we are holding up a greater and greater share every year of conservation funding. And at some point, some other interest group has got to get in and make a contribution too. Listen, if you're a bird watcher, you know, shouldn't we be, you know, let's say your bird seed. Let's put it, you know small excise tax on bird seed to pay for neotropical migratory bird conservation? Should we be doing something with binoculars? Should we be, should mountain bikes be, or bicycles be, you know, have an excise tax that pays for maintenance of bike trails or creation of new bike trails? I mean, we got to start thinking in those terms because, you know, I'm not necessarily keen on opening up, you know, Dingle Johnson or Pittman Robertson and you know, bringing other things in because I like the fact that we pay for you know fish and wildlife conservation, but at the same time, I feel strongly that we need to create other programs like those from other interest groups to help carry the load and the things they care about. Now, you talk specifically about Pittman Robertson. There's one thing we are trying to change right now with that: uh, the Dingle Johnston program, which is the fishing side. They can use a small portion of those revenues, but basically for what we call R3, which is you know, recruitment, retention, reactivation. And so if you see the Take Me Fishing campaign, which is a big national campaign, has a Hispanic equivalent in, you know, trying to reach out to Hispanic folks. But the whole effort there is to engage folks, to get them interested in fishing, to make it easier to go out and buy a license, to, you know, do boating and all that. And it's been really successful in turning around the trend of declining license sales. We can't do that on the hunting side. There's the authorization, the Pittman Robertson Act, doesn't allow us to use any of those dollars, us being the states, to basically pay for those R3 activities. So I think that is a change that needs to be made. Um, we're pushing that with a bunch of our partner groups um, so that we can get out there and really try to engage and reactivate you know, the hunters you know, who are out there, because that really is the future of the sport. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've already um, kind of visited this area a couple times, but um, we kind of, we, you know, we're interested um, in Texas um, being, uh, it's kind of an anomaly of sorts, um, considering that we don't have a whole lot of public land um, percentage wise, but there's a, there are several state owned lands that have been around some time now and are available for public use. How does Texas actually compare with some of these Western states? on the public land issues uh, and the public land transfer issues, and, and why should we care as Texans? Well, I mean, I think there's, you know, it, you know, it's hard to say what's right or wrong. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you guys don't have a ton of public lands. I'm sure you you appreciate what you've got a lot. Um, you know, but at the same time, I know a ton of people in Texas go to Colorado, to Wyoming, to Idaho, to Montana, yep. and hunt and fish. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that primarily on the public lands. So even if it isn't necessarily a Texas issue, Texans enjoy the benefits of public lands. I mean, I, I think about some of the debates we have about Alaska and like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge or the Pebble Mine area in Bristol Bay. Those are areas I might never ever get to, but I like knowing they're out there. I like knowing they're producing a gazillion salmon and, you know, really, you know, sort of keeping the Alaska that I have in my mind there for, you know, my kids to enjoy someday. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, even if you don't, you know, you don't live in a public land state. You can appreciate the public lands. You can appreciate what they mean to being American and what they mean to being a sportsman in America. Right. Yeah, I agree. We we uh, have put the public lands to use in the several of the states surrounding Texas. Casey and I have. He's 
he actually uh, shot a nice six by six in Colorado last year on public land. So we uh, we get it for sure. We just want the listeners to you know understand that uh, just because they may not uh, use them like you said doesn't mean that their son or grandson or granddaughter may not go out there one day. You know. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it's also just it's, it's something that makes America unique. I mean, you know, the system we have and, you know, to a lesser degree, Canada and Mexico have are unique in really all the world. And really, it's the envy of the world. And, you know, any you look at America and any of the game species, you know, that we have out there, every single game species we have is in good shape because hunters pay for conservation. We pay for you know, well-managed habitat. We pay for enforcement of the laws. We pay for the science to regulate that. And, you know, so, and, you know, the public lands are kind of the foundation of a lot of that because that's the opportunity folks have to get outside if you, if you don't have the money to, you know, have a lease or, you know, private property yourself. So it's, you know, I just see it as, as, as American as anything else we have. Yeah, for sure. Whit. Uh, this case here again, I uh, kind of feel like the future of hunting is in danger, especially in my own state because of the lack of access and it's essentially become you know a nobility sport if you want to hunt private or have decent access to lands you know my sole ability to hunt um multiple game species in texas whitetail deer turkeys uh, mule deer out west will be on public at all this next season and it's such a catch-22 because i want other Texans to feel passionately about this and have a voice. But at the same time, we are so limited in the amount of public lands we have that if we have a substantial increase of public land hunters, we will not have the acreage necessary to do so, you know? And so it's a a tough situation to be in, you know, do we lobby for more public lands? Do we just, you know, I, I would never say, keep it quiet, you know, but uh, what, what do we do for our future kids? You know, like I want my kids to be able to grow up on hunt and fish and gather and be able to canoe down wild rivers and things like that in Texas. And it's just, it's so hard to get to. So where do we go from here? Yeah. You know, I, you know listen, I hear you, Casey. And I think that, you know, I don't know what the future is in Texas, what you guys can do about it. I'm sure that, you know, Listen, there are a bunch of programs out there to you know, buy land and to you know, convert them into you know, public spaces, land and water conservation fund, which is actually funded by oil and gas revenues. You know, that's, you know, in theory, there's $900 million a year that could be used to purchase you know, lands for the public. And a lot of our great hunting lands and sort of access opportunities have come through you know, land and water conservation funds. So even if, if there were opportunities in Texas, some big ranch is coming up for sale and the state really wanted to, you know, get it to provide public hunting and fishing, it certainly could. Um, granted, you know, it's a little bit expensive in Texas nowadays. But I think the key thing is, listen, you can always, you know, jump into your car, you can drive for a day, and you can be in some amazing, you know, public lands. And, you know, even if you don't have it in Texas, you know, that's, you know, it makes you going to appreciate what you have in Colorado even more, or New Mexico, or, you know, places like that, where it's your, you can get to without that much difficulty. And, yeah, it's a bit of a road trip. You can't do it after work each day, but it's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, for sure. And that's something that me and my family have taken advantage of many times in the past. You know, like Tyler alluded to earlier, I was uh, able to go and harvest a bull elk on public land, OTC, in Colorado this year. And, you know, it may or may not work out this year where I can financially do that. And I like to parallel this some to, like, the um, – oh, you'll know the name of the conservation org, but the, the taming uh, – conservation organization you know i'll never fish for tame in, in mongolia or or china yep. but i love to know that they're still there and i feel like without public lands in north america uh you won't have the guys who sit in texas and dream of listening to bugle elk, bugling bull elk in september and that's just a, a sad thought and not a world i want to live in yeah no i hear you there and you know listen in public access is you know, we have those the big mountains in the you know, western hunting, but you know, public access is also a boat ramp that just allows you to get out onto the Gulf of Mexico and go chase redfish. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a boat ramp on a river that you can go and do a float, or a Corps of Engineers facility where you can get you know, put your boat on and go catch bass. 
you know so i think that you know public access is not just about you know sort of getting into the you know the deep national forests in the back country where you can get that six by six bullets it can be a lot more local and you know not maybe as grandiose but really special especially getting your family outside yeah with that said um um you know how big is the concern base um of conservationists right now that are worried about um public land transfer and how big does it need to be you know what 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 should it be uh to give us you know numbers that we can fight the war with and where do we need to be as far as numbers go and where are we and you know how many how many individuals are using these federal public lands a year well you know if you if you, you know, there's ver- the various statistics are um I forget the exact number, about 13 and a half million people hunt in this country. And of that, you know, probably about half of those folks use public land somewhere all the time. So we're talking, you know, somewhere in that 7 million, you know, people, you know, range. And, you know, that is, you know, we have got, you know, on our sportsaccess.org, you know, petition, we've got about 40,000 folks signed up for that. So we can be doing a whole lot better than we are right now. I mean, I'm happy we have that many, and but I'd love to see that, you know, sort of, you know, double this year and then double again next year as more people realize the threat that's involved with this. I was out at the SHOT Show in um, Las Vegas, and I go out there every year and, you know, work with some of our you know, sponsor friends. But we also host a conservation roundtable, you know, with the outdoor editors from Field of Streams, Sports of Field, Outdoor Life, Peterson's things like that, with, and our partner organizations, just to talk about conservation, what we can expect. And listen, the public lands, you know, sell-off, transfer, that was the hot topic this year. And my point to you know, a lot of those folks in the room is that, you know, I don't think there are going to be many major attacks on the Second Amendment over the next few years, um, you know, with Trump in there. Let's focus some of that attention that we've been focusing on Second Amendment to these public land issues, and let's, you know, put a nail in the coffin of this really bad idea now. That's not going to happen unless we get, you know, sheer numbers. And what those numbers are, just all I know is more is better. And, you know, I really take my hat off to guys like Rennell and Newberg who push this on their vehicles. But in Field and Stream and Outdoor Life do a great job in those publications talking about public lands. But, listen, I'd love to see, you know, all the publications really embrace this and push it and make it a litmus test issue. Um. So as far as uh, TRCP is concerned, you know, uh, or any conservation organization for that matter, what uh, can the, the simple individual do to kind of vet an organization and know that their funds that they are donating are being put to use effectively? Great, great question. Um, a couple things. One, you know, everybody's got a website these days. Go on there. If you don't see the public and land issue fairly prominently on there, Ask a question as to, gee, how come you guys aren't engaged in this issue, or what are you doing? If you don't like the response, you know, go someplace else. Mm-hmm. You also, I would look at things like, you know, all the groups are a little bit different. Um, there are some independent watchdog groups that rate charities in terms of like where your, you know, dollars, you know, bang for the buck. There's an organization called Charity Navigator that gives you anywhere from zero to four stars, depending on you know, how efficient you are. We're a four-star organization. Um, which means that we have very low overhead. Most of the money we raise goes directly to conservation. But, you know, that's another thing that, you know, they can check on. Um, but, you know, just, I mean, and listen, I mean, you know, if you're a mule deer hunter, you know, there are organizations you're tend- going to tend to favor. Go to those organizations and, you know, check them out. And listen, if you don't see anything on their website about the public land issue, ask them. Say it's important to you and how come they're not engaged and, you know, challenge them to get engaged. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, um, I guess kind of wrapping this thing up, you know, how can, how can guys like us from Texas where we're not necessarily close to the subject, um, at hand, how can we help? What can we do to help the issue? Well, one thing you can do is your senators and representatives votes in Congress count just as much as, you know, somebody from Wyoming or Utah or one of the public land states. So let's make sure that your folks down there in Texas and you guys are letting your elected representatives know that the public lands are important to you, even if you don't have a ton of them in Texas. And, uh, you know, so that's one thing you can do, too. Keep getting the word out and, you know, keep you know, pushing this. You know, it's like, you know, you know, 
everybody wants to have dessert, but you got to have a few vegetables with it, and this is the vegetables. So we got to talk about this stuff, and we've got to push it, um, or else we can't really enjoy the dessert down the road. <laughs> um, I think that you know the, I think those are the really key things. I mean, you'd be very really hard. I mean, having been here in Washington for a long time. It's hard for me to overstress the importance of direct contact with your members of Congress. I mean, it's one thing to sign a petition on our website, and I want everyone to do that, but it's even more important to write an individual letter, to place a phone call, to go to a town hall meeting where your you know, senator or member of Congress is going to be showing up and speak to them about this, speak to their staff about it, because that is worth a 1,000 email signatures. Mm-hmm. Well, awesome. We know you're a busy man and, and have a lot on your plate right now, so we would really do appreciate the time. Um, where can someone go to donate to TRCP if they're interested in doing such? Uh, TRCP.org is our website, and uh, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff uh, about our issues, including the public lands issues. And if you want to become a member, make a donation, get a nice little gift in return for a donation, uh, it should be pretty easy for you to follow it and do it there. I also, you know, go to that sportsaccess.org site, you know, sign the petition. That's not a money-raising site, but uh, at the same time, it's important for political advocacy. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll make sure to link to all that in the show notes. And uh, once again, we appreciate it, Witt. Thank you for your vast amount of knowledge on this short episode, man. All right, Tyler, KC, anytime you want me back, let me know. Yes, sir, we will do it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Witt. All right, thanks, guys. All right, bye. Bye Bye-bye. Man, what a load of information. My goodness, dude. That is a smart guy. I'm so glad we got to talk to Wit. I was uh, kind of flustered. Like I couldn't really talk because he was just <laughs> like, he would answer half my questions that I had next, you know, and then I would be sitting there like flat-footed thinking about something, like really deeply about something he would, he would <laughs> Exactly. Saying. Yeah, Wit is expanding our minds here, and we're supposed to actually ask this guy questions, like, are we worthy? You know? Yeah. Like, no, but man, so much thanks to him coming and talking to us. He's a busy guy, and this is a yep. busy and trying time for uh, all sportsmen everywhere, especially those ones in such high places as him. Yep. On another note here, um, we have released uh, a couple of videos recently um, through – our media channels, which include YouTube and Facebook. Um, so KC did an elk fajitas video and we might've talked about that in the last podcast, but, uh, we finished that up. It's a really super cool video. It's short, it's under four minutes and it shows you uh, step by step, um, what his, his thought process is when preparing and, uh, cooking these, uh, fajitas. And so he gets to showcase a little bit of his Tex-Mex side. Um, and then we released uh, also another video that's a it's a fishing video um, called Valley of Life, and it's basically a, a trip I went on with a good buddy of mine who helped me to video the whole thing, and we went to uh, the Valley of It All or Valley of It All, however you want to say it, um, in New Mexico, which is a incredible area where I guess it rains like every afternoon there in the summer because uh, it's just lush green. Um, and tons of meadow section um, with Rio Grande cutthroats, wild and native, in their 8% or whatever of the range that they originally inhabited, doing what they do, feeding on dry flies, hoppers, and, and caddis flies. And, and woolly boogers. Woolly boogers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you'll see that if you watch it. Watch it. Uh, but I, I, we had an original version of that that I, that I did that was like uh, probably close to 16 minutes, and uh, I have kind of – taking it and shorten it down to make the best of the best. And I think it's under eight minutes now. So it's a quick little watch, you know, and it, it, feel, it gives you a little bit of the story of, uh, and the beauty of that area. So definitely, uh, go check that out on our, our, uh, Facebook channel or our, our Facebook page. Um, and make sure you, uh, keep up with our Instagram and subscribe, uh, to our YouTube channel as well to make sure that you're, you're seeing these videos as they come out. Yeah. Um, another thing, too, guys, uh, and something near and dear to my heart and Tyler's, too, like we all utilize public lands and dream to to use and aspire to be a part of wild places where wild creatures live. And there's no way for those things to continue to exist without our support. Call your uh, state representatives. And just call up and say, say no to House Bill or H.R. 621 and to keep public lands and public hands to just ensure the fact that we have a future in what we love to do and that the animals that we love have a future as well. Absolutely, man. 
definitely do that. And we will uh, make sure to link to in the show notes to uh, we, we can put the phone number in there. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that. I bet we can find that. all the, the representatives of Texas and um, the two senators. I'll link to uh, anything that we can, you know, use to get in touch with uh, these representatives. And then we're going to link to um, uh, the sportsmansaccess.org uh, that Witt talked about earlier, as well as the TRCP. Uh, make sure that you guys have the opportunity to uh, donate to those causes if you want to and to be involved. Um, and then also, um, uh, I may throw out just a little plug here for uh, BHA, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, um, which we are a part of, and they are doing great things within um, the political spectrum as well, doing uh, lots of legislative work um, and trying to make sure and let sportsmen know who is on their side within our representatives and who is not. So um, anyway, a couple of great organizations there. Make sure you go check them out. Have all that linked in the show notes as long as well as the uh, we'll do a couple of links to the new videos that we put out. And um, I think that's going to be about it for us, man. Uh, make sure that if um, you enjoyed this episode, <clears throat> that you go to iTunes and give us a uh, five star review and make sure that you uh, have subscribed to the podcast so that you can be um, updated every time that we update the, the uh, feed here and you can get the newest podcast before anybody else does. So uh, anyway, appreciate you guys listening. Um, I hope that you found it interesting and, and, uh, and that you learned something today. Um, as always, God bless, and uh, we'll see you soon. Make sure to get out and live in your element.